record now. Cool, that gone through? Brilliant. Brilliant. All right, so I'm joined with Andrew Holland, a uh, former police officer, boxer, judoka, all around nice guy. And uh, hello, welcome. Hey, good to be here. Pleasure. Thank you very much for the invite, Tommy. Uh, so, you know, we've, I get a lot of questions from people about police and the law, and, and most normal people, their only interaction with the police is minor things like speeding tickets or someone's nicked the bike out of my shed or basic things like that. I wanted to give people the chance to, to ask some practical questions and hopefully give some martial arts instructors some, some things to think about, some things to know. Um, but if you could start, just give us a bit of background about you, what you study, a little bit about your career, that'd be really great for people to know. Yeah, okay, so um, I'm no longer a police officer. I was a police officer for 17 years, but I joined at age 16 under what was a cadet program. So that was like a full-time program. You, you, we, I moved to Stafford five days a week, went home on the weekend. For the first year, you worked all kind of did crazy stuff, like, like you learned how first aid, we did swimming, you know, mountaineering, loads of stuff like that. It was a lot of personal development stuff with a police gear. Uh, we'd have camps, so you had to go on these camps where you had to learn how to walk and and map read and everything like that. So we did those things. And um, the second year, you went to police stations. So the other thing in the first year, what they did is give you attachments so that would change your perception on the world. So I had to work in a supermarket for eight weeks. I had to go work in an old people's home for eight weeks. I was a sighted guide for the blind at a hotel in the Lake District. So it was a lot of uh, work with the disabled. So it was a lot of practical skills designed to make you more understanding of the world rather than just join the police force at 18 and then um, get in. And then we paid for it, which was cool. So the second year you went out on uh, to the police stations and worked in every department in the police force. And then by the time you were 18, you, when you turned 18, you could actually go out on patrol until 10 p.m. at night. You'd have no cuffs or angles or anything like that. You'd go to generally to low in, low violent incidents, but you'd learn how to communicate and would, would tutored tutor to a degree. Plus you'd work in the front office and have to handle all kinds of things. So, um, and you did that before you were 18 actually. And then at 18 and three quarters, don't ask me why, you join up to the regular police force. And that's where I started my career working in Stoke-on-Trent and in a town called Hanley, which is pretty rough or it certainly was at the time. And yeah, I've worked, um, generally frontline for a long time. Then I moved into covert policing, informant handling, became qualified as a sergeant, went on the promotional bandwagon, and then, um, you know, worked a lot of front time, front line, did a lot of acting sergeanting, but then I developed really bad asthma. So I ended up spending um, time in, the, in the, what they call the custody investigation team for quite some time, which is specializing in investigating, uh, prison, interviewing prisoners and dealing with uh, crime and in, in, in the interview process and the file building process. And then, yeah, I retired and started up my marketing business because that seemed like a fun, fun idea to do. So um, because they wouldn't promote me, that was the thing. They wouldn't promote me with my asthma because they would only want to promote frontline staff. So I left. That's where I am. Um, been a judo player, boxer, started boxing very young. <clears throat> Pardon me, my father was a police officer, uh, so I was immersed in police for a long time. He's also a boxing coach as well, and a professional coach he was. Um, I was an amateur boxer for a long time, uh, been judo, and didn't access a lot of martial arts, and then started blogging at some point during that whole journey and taught self-defense for a bit. Started my own school that didn't go too well because it was you know I didn't know anything about marketing which has led to the website and then been blogging about self defense generally annoying a lot of people in the self defense industry poking holes in a lot of myths and upsetting a lot of people ever since so yeah that's that's me <laughs> that's awesome that's really awesome you know and most people you know they never get to hear about police officers unless it's something bad you know whether you've done something bad or your family members are about it I think it's good for people to see. There is good, there is bad, there's everything in between, and you know, just like everyone else, doing doing a doing a job. Um, yeah. and the variables are all out there. What I've got is a list of some questions from some people that are interested in, from a broadly kind of policing legal perspective, things that are good to know and, and good yeah. to be aware of, and and help people keep themselves safe. You know, I think you know, Jeff Thompson named this really well. You know, the three fights: there's the fight before the fight, the fight, and the fight after the fight. And I think. You know, people spend a less time than they should thinking about the fight after the fight. And that could be a millisecond after the, the physical element has ended, you're now in the next phase. So it's good, good mm -hmm. for people to, to explore it. So I'll just move through some of the questions. Uh, cool. First one, 
So what should you expect? So let's say, let's say a, a, a low to medium level fight has broken out, a fight over a car parking space, a, a typical kind of pub conflict, a couple of punches, pushing, shoving, no, no clear antagonist, protagonist. You know, that what, should, what, what practically, a conflict occurs, a police officer arrives, what typically happens, or police officers arrive, what happens? Okay, so what we probably need to do to start off with is reframe things a little bit. So we're looking at this from the side of the police officer, which we never ever do. So um, my understanding is that most police officers right now on the street, at least 70 odd percent of them have got less than two years servicing. And that was to do with a long range of austerity measures put in by the government and a lack of recruiting. So um, what, what ended up happening is uh, you've got a lot of police officers with a lot of inexperience on there. Now, what happens with police officers, if you think about what they do, they are basically storytellers. And every story starts in once upon a time. That's the message the police officers get in the car or wherever they are. Once upon a time, there are two men fighting in the street. Once upon a time, there is a woman being chased down the street. Once upon a time, there is a man out unconscious on the floor and there's a gang around him. So whatever message that gets through, that's the initial story. And when the that it's it's one of the big weird things about policing and reporting crime who calls for it first matters quite a lot because there's a lot of accountability with the story because police officers have to be accountable to home office recording uh, statistics i know you'll have a gloving audience but it's generally the same across the world they'll you know when someone calls up that's a member of the public reporting an incident and that incident there's an accountability and there'll be accountability and follow up by people looking at this the next day and what was done what wasn't done so they start off with that once upon a timeline and they drive at speed usually with blue lights on now I, I did, I've done a lot of blue light driving and let me tell you now, your adrenaline's up the second you put those blue lights on because you're driving at speed in hazardous conditions and if you hurt or kill somebody or kill a passenger, then life, the, the investigations into you with police vehicle incidents is horrendous. So there's a lot of pressure on people, plus you're getting information coming through to you from the radio, you're being asked questions and many times, although they have hand-free kits now, we used to drive almost with one hand on the radio and one hand on the wheel and the other thing, the officer can be single crew which is more often than usual so the officers thinking to themselves what am i turning up to here and they've got all that information front loaded and they've had an awful lot of information probably given to them in the space of a few minutes driven really fast and they rock up at the incident and there they've already got that first narrative they don't know who's attacked who they don't know anything they've got a little tiny bit of information given to them by a witness who on the phone and then you get there and they've got that situation in front of them to actually understand and comprehend but when they get there at the end of the day if somebody's unconscious on the floor or, or it's got a serious injury and if you're a self-defense practitioner you've defended yourself well enough that the, the person should either be you know stopped on the floor they should be unconscious or certainly blood a bloody mess you know that's just the way it should be if you've got self-defense skills and unless you know and it's gone physical and when they get there and they see somebody on the floor the narrative is that it's continued somebody has hurt him there's an assault been taken place there is a crime it's quite clear there's a crime there's an assault so the element about self-defense is that that you've assaulted somebody but self-defense is your claim that it was okay to do so so, but that's assault still needs investigating. And very often, you know, the, the, the very often the guy who starts it will be the biggest moaner of all, or, you know, hey, he just hit me. Well, we don't know what's gone on beforehand and things like that. So you've got a situation where you've got somebody uh, on the floor assaulted, and then you've got somebody standing and is being the deemed as the attacker. And that's the crime. That's the crime. It doesn't matter what the scenario, the circumstances are at that point. Somebody's injured, somebody isn't. And that's what they're investigating, that narrative. It's the self-defense element is what has to be generally proved afterwards. And then that, that relies on telling the story. But you're right in what you say about the three fights in terms of, you know, just because you've successfully defended yourself doesn't mean that you have successfully achieved the goal of self-defense. Because just because you think you defended yourself and you've been, had the right to do so, that might be very different from a legal perspective. So that's what the police officers turn up to, and that's what they've got. And they've got to investigate the crime. They're duty-bound to do so. They're bound lawfully and legally to do so. And quite rightly, anybody would want them to investigate. But it doesn't always go to plan, does it? <laughs> no. So what kind of things will you be asked? So that the police obviously, they'll come in, they'll make sure 
any injured people are, are looked after and, and right support is called in, I should imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, they tend to ask a lot of questions there or will they tend to want to request you in the morning or try and bring you know, what, what kind of broadly, what kind of things could happen to you? OK, so it depends on the quality of the officer. And that's the sad truth of things. So as a self, you're right in what you say. I mean, obviously, um, you are, I know you've read the book that I wrote that talks about the same phases and about the importance of this last phase. But the, the, the truth is you've got to control the narrative of the situation you have as an individual as part of you. If you're a self-defense person, you've used your self-defense skills, you've now got to control the narrative and do not expect the police officer to do that for you. They might have a very completely different narrative based on the information they've been given, based on a witness perception, that's phoned in so at that point you've got to then start to look at um controlling it and it might be that you've got to go get information for witnesses and you've got to speak calmly you've got to deliver the information to the police officers in the most calm and professional manner that you can do because if you're irate that if you're angry that actually helps them to form the narrative. If you start swearing at the police officers, well, then that's feeding into whatever narrative's particularly existing. So if the witness has only ever seen you hitting him, didn't see the pre the preemptive, didn't see the before, didn't just saw you go live with a preemptive strike, witness rings up, says, I've just seen a man hit another person. They haven't seen the other bit. And you get there and the police turn up and they're there saying, what's going on? He effing did this, he, he's just come at me, whatever, you know, whatever like that. And you've got this guy on the floor who can't give an account because he's unconscious. Then and realistically, you're feeding into that narrative that you're an aggressive individual, you just hit somebody. So you've got to control the narrative in terms of you've got to control yourself. You've got to look for witnesses. You've got to look to, to try and engage with the police officers in a calm and effective way. Easier said than done. But the worst thing you can do is be is allow the police to just, you know, just do anything like and just come in and, and do things. If there's witnesses, you know, you need to be getting their details. You need to be before the police turn up. You need to get your phone out to get a quick video testimonial. Tell them who you, who they are on camera. So get your phone out these days, and you can say, "Listen, can you just speak into the camera? The police are just about to turn up, and just tell me what, just say what you saw, and say who you are and your address." And so at least you've got some evidence now, because people are transient. You know, when they walk, they want to walk away. They've just seen a fight. They want to walk away. So when the police turn up, you know, and however long that takes, and today it's longer than ever. When the police turns up, you can actually have some information and support that's actually going to do that for you but you've got to be controlling the narrative and explaining the police officer because you want them to know your side of the story they mm -hmm. might still arrest you because that's highly likely because their job is to preserve evidence protect life and limb preserve evidence and that's part of the process to arrest you to get your account is part of that process before you can go and speak to anybody else you know, that's that's they don't want you to interfere with witnesses. That's the truth. That's why it's sometimes better to even just get your information straight off them. And you've got that. And then if they turn up, they're not going to want you to speak to the witnesses. That's the truth, because they want to speak to the witnesses independently. So that initial few seconds might be the first chance you get to speak to the witnesses yourself before you see them in court if you got prosecuted. So there's a lot you can do. Uh, and also, you've got to explain the circumstances calmly to the police officer. But you're still going to get arrested potentially and if you do get arrested then it's about how you handle yourself and explain that narrative all the way through because trust me they they don't want to lock up innocent people but unfortunately if there's somebody out cold who's then got to go to hospital you are the person that's done that and that needs to be investigated whatever the circumstances are so just because you've you think you're acting in self-defense you still assault somebody self-defense is the the defense to that the legal defense to it you've assaulted somebody and it's against the law to assault somebody self-defense is the get out clause to say why you did it so that's that's the why it's so dangerous to even use self-defense skills because you are actually committing an assault you are it's no two ways about it and you are then legally responsible for that you've assaulted somebody else you've caused harm to somebody else's body you know and it, as a result you've got to justify that use justify that use of force and so let, let's say that does happen. So you're you're the, the innocent party. You've defended yourself. It's all a bit messy. It's late at night. The police have decided to arrest you to preserve evidence, to deal with it elsewhere, to, to move away from the, the broken glass and the kebab shops and all the other nonsense going on. What 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 to expect? So you're in the, you know, are, are people handcuffed more often than not? Are you typically invited to go there within a certain time frame or are you often kind of just brought directly into the vehicle taken 
It, it depends. It honestly depends on the circumstances. But normally, very normally, and it depends on the police force as well, because some have got prison handling teams, prison transport teams, the officers, and some forces, the officers will do everything. And some and some forces have got investigating statement takers, and it's been McDonaldized, if you want to call it that way. The whole justice process has, which is a, 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 an issue, but there's money for you at the end of the day in, in budgets. So what tends to happen, if I take it as a, as a police force, standard police force, or how I used to work in, then you would be arrested. Now, you, the purpose of handcuffing you is to, one, is, is actually to protect the officer because you're an unknown risk. You've either got known risks or unknown risks. And if you're sit, standing there and you've got a bit about yourself, you look powerful, you've just done that, then their intelligence is that this man's capable of causing other people harm. They know that because of the evidence is there. So they will handcuff you. Now, they'll either handcuff you to the front or handcuff you to the back. If you are a particularly big-shouldered person, well, I mean, it can happen to anyone, but mostly if you're a big shoulder like yourself, being handcuffed to the rear is incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. I couldn't do it. It's very difficult for me to be handcuffed to the rear. Now, you can be handcuffed um, traditionally like this, or you can be handcuffed to the stacked fashion. And uh, it will generally depend on what the officer is more comfortable with. But if you, you know, if you're aggressive in any way, shape, or form, they're going to try and handcuff you to the rear and put you on the floor, you know, face down, and get those arms behind the back and handcuff you. And very often they will ask people to, you know, you will say, "Can you, you know, put your hands behind your back?" Now, again, it depends on the skill to the officer experience. But if you're 16, 17 stone, and the officer's 10 stone, and when I joined up, I was 10 stone. You know, I was a, a young lad. When the officer's smaller, the risk to them is greater. That's just the real the reality of it. So handcuffing behind the back gives that smaller officer more leverage. A lot don't do that because that's the difficult thing to do. Because once you've handcuffed to the front and then you're fighting them, they've got a as, as, they've got a weapon here they can hit you with quite quite seriously. And they can also run off. It's very difficult to run off with handcuffs behind your back. It's very easy to run off with handcuffs in your front, you know. And also because if you're in your body like this, you've got a lot of leverage still. So handcuffing is is the next step. So the handcuffing, getting you in the car, taking you to custody, that's all part of the process. And a lot of um, issues can happen with the handcuffs because they, they're, they, they still, they'll be incredibly painful. And you could be in a holding cell for up to 30 minutes before booking in. And when you get to the police station, you've got to get out of the car. It's a horrible process. And those handcuffs are rigid handcuffs, cause a lot of bruising. They cause a lot of injury. They are, vi they are vile to wear for any period of time. And that does set people off. Handcuffing sets people off. Nobody wants to be handcuffed. And it's a sign that you feel you're guilty. So if someone's applying handcuffs to you, that's like should be the, the penny that goes off to say, okay, I need to take this seriously. Because right now, I'm in handcuffs being led away. It's a horrible experience. If you're a decent person, being handcuffed is a vile experience. But you've got to understand that that's part of the process because they're trying to protect themselves and also to stop you from escaping because they don't know you. You're an unknown person, unknown risk. You'll get to the police station, at which point the officers will talk about the circumstances about your arrest, the custody detention officer or the sergeant. So I'd say the sergeant approves it's different. Sometimes what they have is a CDO or, uh, behind the desk and then a sergeant sits behind them who can authorize it. It's different systems in place. But they'll, you'll, they'll give the, uh, the reasons for the arrest. And at that point, your, your stay is either your, the arrest or the detention is either refused or authorized. And then you go through the standard booking procedure and rights, and it's very all on camera. Everyone's there, it's 24 hour surveillance, audio surveillance, everything. So you, from that point on, as soon as you get into the custody block, everything's watched. And, and you know, you've got your legal rights and, it's, and you're under the bright lights. And are, you, are your rights typically read? So, so as soon as they decide you're going to be arrested, anything you say before you're arrested is that circumstantial. So as soon as, soon as you are read your rights, that that is you, that is you shutting up essentially. Well, everything's evidence, but yeah. when you get cautioned, you know, you don't have to say anything and all that kind of thing. What they say is basically they're saying that after you've said those things, you I mean everything beforehand is fine, but you know what they're saying afterwards is, Hey, listen, we are investigating a criminal offense of which we believe you are a suspect of anything you say can be used as evidence against you so if you're going to admit things everything we it's a bit of a weird thing because we use everything in the front every the police officers use everything that's said as evidence because that's part of part of the police officer's uh, statement uh, but basically they they can they will everything afterwards you know that you are a suspect 
Right. So you were being investigated. So, you know, you it, it, at that point, really, you shut your mouth anyway, because, yeah. because it doesn't serve you any purpose to say anything to the police officer after you've been cautioned. It doesn't. The decision has been made to arrest you. It, you can give evidence. There's information you give beforehand, which is like, can help police officers to make their decision. But ultimately, once they arrest you, they've made their decision. So then you shut up until you get legal advice. And that's the best way to handle it. And just ask, answer the questions by the, the custody officer and the custody team, what they ask you. Be polite. You be, be treat anybody like you would treat anyone. And just understand that this is a process that you've got to go through because you chose to use force. And that's that, that is ultimately it. That if you, this is the process, you made the decision to pre, pre, proactively strike them, preemptively, whatever you want to call it, or defend yourself. You had to defend yourself, but this still is the process because you had to do that. It's part of a much longer, and in martial art is what we do, or certainly the self defense industry is really good at the first fight, the second fight, but then they're awful at this bit. Because what they do is they shorten it down to this. I'd rather be carried, carried by, I'd rather be judged by than carried by rhetoric. But that's not the reality. Like, you know, the reality is you, the incident takes about three minutes at most. You've got to think that in a violent incident at most, you know, before and after, usually far less than that. Then you could spend 20 years in jail. Yeah. So in actual fact, we need to be focusing on the most important bit first, which is the end. And then building your system of self-defense based on the end. So you've got the beginning, right? And the second, and that goes into what techniques you use, what preemptive you use, the, 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 the action you use to avoid violence. Because what I say to people is, is if you've ever stood in Crown Court, where it is a zero part of my language, BS, so I was gonna, you know, it's zero, you've got zero time for any martial arts attitude. If you're a martial artist, you are already under the scrutiny as a violent person. There is a, 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 you will be painted like that by the prosecution. That's the way they're gonna present you, obsessed with martial arts, puts out weekly channel on martial arts, written boots on martial arts, is a violent, is attracted in, in, by violence. That's the, that's the paint they're gonna paint you with. So your systems of martial arts, Whatever you do, you've got to understand and build them so that the end situation is far easier for you. And that's where we see a lot of the problem becoming because too many people are focused on techniques and we see them all the time and jump to this desire that I'm going to preemptively strike. I'm going to knock them out or do this, that and the other. And I'm going to walk away and I'll be fine because I don't care because I'd rather be uh, judged. I'd rather be judged than carried. Well, yeah, listen, these people don't care about that rhetoric. They, they're paid. They're very expensive lawyers who are paid a lot of money to send you down. And they do not care about the BS that we see within the self defense industry. Their job is to to achieve the result. So. Yeah. And and so when it comes to a lot of people are worried that if you say nothing to the police officer or say very little, that can be perceived as rude or antagonistic. Would a police officer typically see it that way, or would they see that as that's absolutely your call to make? It's fine. Yeah, the, the way I would say it to anybody is you just say, listen, you've arrested me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, not say anything until I've got legal advice. That's it. You don't have to fall out with the police officer. You don't have to be back. Even if you've got an idiot police officer, and I know they exist. I was in the organization. I worked with some of them. You know, you, you know, if you've got an idiot police officer who's trying to get you wound up, who's trying to say things to wind you up, you, you know, that's a separate game. You're in a different game now. You're in a different fight. That's the fight for your freedom. So there are lots of fights and micro fights within self-defense and every situation's got, you know, if you're on the ground, you're in a micro fight to get control and, you, and you're making decisions. And if a police officer is uh, rude to you, is uh, trying to get you wound up, you've got to keep yourself control. You've got to win that battle as well. The battle for you to get to custody where the lights are on, where the sergeant is there, where, where that behavior isn't tolerated, you know, whatever it is, you've got to, you've got to do that. And that's your battle. And it's be very polite. Listen, I'm not going to speak to you. I'm just going to get to custody and, and, and wait for legal representation. I don't think, you know, most police officers, won't, unless they've got a real bad attitude, won't do anything like that. But you can't give them any excuse to do anything more. You've got to understand they've got a job to do and you want to allow them to do that job as easy as possible. You know, that's a win. It's like boxing. You know, you want to make the judges night as easy as possible. And, the, you know, you knock that guy's head back. 
repeatedly. That's how you make the judges know. They want they want to have the chicken in the basket and go home. And uh, you know, with with the police officers, do you think a police officer honestly comes to work to want to have grief? They just want to go home as an easiest shift as possible. And most police officers want to do as least work as possible because that's human nature. So you've got to think they're paid whether they do a lot of work or a little work, and they want to do as little work as possible. So, and that's the best way to deal with these things. Apart from, you will find police officers, some of them, who want to get into aggressive situations. They are they were attracted to the job for the wrong reasons. We know this. We know they're out there. There's enough media coverage on those. And if you encounter those, that's a different situation because that becomes you against the police officer, and you've got to then maintain your narrative, control that narrative. It's your case. They go home at seven in the morning. You don't. You're still in the cells for 24 hours. So yeah, you've got to understand this is part of a bigger picture. The case, the self-defense isn't successfully done until you have been told you are not being prosecuted or until you are told you're innocent at court. That's how long the situations last. Okay. Uh, when it comes to witnesses, so people that are watching, the, watching a, a confrontation, watching something happen, I mean, just how unreliable are witnesses and how important is it to make it very clear to others in CCTV that you, you don't want none of it? You know, how, how important witnesses and, and how how little can you trust in them yeah okay so uh witnesses are incredibly unreliable they are there's lots of studies around the there's lots of studies um you know the gorilla experiments uh, the invisible gorilla experiment there's lots of mental studies in relation to witnesses and um and how witnesses is, is in, witnesses are perceived what they see what they don't see and uh, it's at the end of the day somebody sees what they want to see. We know that we don't see with our own eyes. Our, our brain puts the images together. We know that based on photons and light bounces on things. But the legal system is very antiquated. It doesn't take into those aspects. So the idea is they get as many witnesses as possible, and that allows to build up a picture. The great thing is these days there's so much CCTV. Everyone's got a phone. Police officers have body-worn cameras. So there's a lot more visual evidence that can't be misinterpreted. But witnesses are unreliable. Witnesses are intoxicated. Witnesses also have preconceived ideas about things, preconceived hatred about certain cultures certain people we all got biases you know and as a result witnesses can be unreliable and witnesses are dishonest as well you don't necessarily say just because a witness says something it's true the amount of witnesses that lie is ridiculous you know and that's the reason they lie for their own agendas they lie for the agendas of their friends so you know and that's another part of the, the process you know if you're thinking about you know, say, for example, some, some guy has a go at you and he's got two women with him and, and he's there having a go at you for some reason, just trying bravado. Well, those two women might be his witnesses that are going to say that you're the one who started it all. And they'll probably go to court and say that, you know, so this is the, the thing. And it's the other side of the situation as well, because police officers are legally allowed to sit together after the incident and write it up. It's part of the process. Yes, they've got body camera footage, potentially, if it's been kept on as well. But then what you've got to do is they'll sit down and create an event. And as it always said to me, there's a big difference between telling the truth and giving evidence. Telling the truth or telling what's going on is the most boring thing going because it go, there's so many different things. Judges can't make that, that. Judges want that story, that easily digestible story. And everybody wants that. The CPS wants an easily digestible story broken down. They call it a case summary. So, you know, they want to read, they've got to read the case summary. They'll read the statements before they make a charging decision. And so the, this is a story. So it's important that they tell the story. And you, but also there's a caveat to that. And you need to have legal advice of whether to shut your mouth in the interview or not. That's another side of the tale because, you know, that, that, is, that is an entirely different game and it depends on circumstances. But the witnesses are going to tell a story. The police are going to tell a story. And, you know, depending on, on, on what information is available. So witnesses don't always tell the truth. And you could end up being the guy who's perfectly morally in the right, yet in the prison cells. And that's, that is the reality. So we have to think about these things before we're so willingly to engaging in violence and getting involved in things, um, you know, and also online and stuff like that, it can carry on. Uh, one question we had come up was, uh, people are quite interested in what type of training police officers get. So when it, when it comes to you know, the, the verbal and the physical sides of self-defense, what, what, would, what would your typical, how would your typical police officer be trained? It's changed over the years. I got excessive amounts of training, you know, because I we did self-defense training at 16 and cadets were exposed to that. We did, um, you know, very old fashioned. It was a, it was a bespoke. We used to do it every week almost. 
And then, you know, when I was boxing and stuff like that. And then we generally, and then we did, we, we went to, used to go to a place called Brighton on Dunsmore, I did. And they used to have Hensford Police College where, where you'd undergo quite, you'd live residential and you'd have a lot of training. But it's changed over the years because at the end of the day, a police officer on the streets, police officer in a classroom isn't a police officer on the streets. And that's, it, that's a, there's, there's a time issue with that. So if you take up so many police officers for a week to train or two weeks to train, that's two weeks where you haven't got 10 police officers on the street. You know, and you, and you cascade that to how many courses you're running it, it, you can actually end up having more of the police officers in training than they have in the street and that's not a circumstances that you, that, that's going to be great for the public so the training my understanding is they get training it's either a week or two weeks i don't know how much and then depending on your role you get refresher training so it could be like two days a year four days a year it totally depends on the department the style of training it is is um martial artists won't like to hear this but most people most police officers arrest people with very little of martial arts ability and extremely violent people. They do. It's, it's just the way it is. You can maul people to the ground, get the hands behind the back relatively between one or two of you. And, and it's pretty easy. Most police officers get by. That's what the training is. You know, you know that. What the training is supposed to do, certainly when I was in the job, they did things like the hammer strikes, the slaps, the, the, the knee, knee strikes, you know, the, the basic punching all the way up to handcuffing and things like that um and then you did the cs work and cell extraction and things but it isn't it isn't very in-depth you've got a lot to cover and these people most police officers aren't martial artists you know 99 percent of people in the police force do not train in martial arts these are just regular people many who are educated these days and they have to go to university and things like that they're not interested in fighting they're interested in being police officers many of them want to go through the ranks for various reasons and so these aren't tough guys or tough ladies who are interested in some, and some do, it's a byproduct. There's some very hard police officers and tough, tough police officers and great martial artists who are police officers. But the, the reality is they aren't, but that's not what they're being paid for. They're really being paid for the 99% of the work that is not physical, mm -hmm. you know, and the investigative skills and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and hopefully they've been paid for their communication skills that stop things going physical, that stop arrests from turning violent and but. Sadly, there is, you know, that's still, that's still an issue. But police training is, at the end of the day, it's not probably, I'm sure they'd agree it's not good enough. Um, the other part of the problem is that with police training, so many people, martial artists want to lead it. So, you know, if you think about it from an, a simple point, it makes no sense from inexperienced martial art, for martial artists who are very experienced, who are inexperienced in dealing with police officers or police police incidents to come up with a training program based on observation. So there isn't that meeting in the middle. They used to do it. What they did was split the training department. So they had police officers in and civilians in to, so they could, and that makes sense. So you've got that collaborative approach. So experience and, and, and inexperience. I'm not sure how, how, what it's like now and, and what every force is like. So you draw upon the marshal and then you for pressure test, but the techniques they work have to be, the techniques they get have to be so that anybody can do them with limited amount of skill and training. And that's the thing. You've got to get back out on the streets. So it, yeah, everyone would love police officers to be black belts in judo and, you know, and have 10 years boxing experience and, and everything like that. Just, just that can't happen. We just don't have, people just don't have the time. So yes, they've got limited skills and that's made up with by kit now. They've got tasers, CS spray, batons, you know, those are all the things that they've got. And I'm sure in the future we'll see crazy stuff get brought out on the marketplace but you know the kit the idea of the kit is to, to reduce the amount of physical skills you know but the best thing a police officer can have is great communication and that's that's the skill and, and then to be fair that's the best skill probably the martial artists need to work on is their communication so so with that said what, what do you say are some good tips on de-escalation so if, if you get to if you're in an incident and it's and it's heated you know with your you know, from your police perspective, what worked well in calming people down? Do you know what? There's two issues here. One is your ego. We've all got one. And um, depending what happens, and I am the worst person at, at this, to be honest with you, because since I left the police, I found it very difficult to control my anger at times, you know, especially with people who really take the, the, the you know, the pee out of you, you know, and to, we all know it. They go around, someone cuts you up at the drive, sticks the fingers up at you, whatever. It, it is designed to enrage you. And then, and, and I think... We've got a lot of, uh, especially if we're talking about men, because men are the ones who are mostly involved in these incidents. We've got a lot of male mental health issues that are pre quite prevalent in terms of um, male status driven. You know, it's all about who eats first, the alpha male, and especially martial artists 
are along that line of thinking generally. Um, and then there's a lot of steroid use. We know that in the, in, within the male community, there's all kinds of problems. So with de-escalation, it's easier said than done. And it also depends on your framework, who you with, who's who, you know, if you're with a partner or friends, are you losing status? So that's the big thing about your status. You've got to eject your ego when it comes to de-escalation. And that is really easy to say and incredibly difficult to do. And especially if you've had a drink, if you are slightly intoxicated, your ability to de-escalate is great. So we can give these isolated uh, situations and say, yeah, this is how I would de-escalate a situation. But ultimately, um, it's very difficult to do. But the reality is there's some, I, I, you know, I use a verbal control system that I, that I write down in the book. It's the best way to do it is to think about de-escalation. Um, the, there's two things that probably stand up in the mind of de-escalation. One, you've got to be at the very bottom. So if you're angry, you're only going to go up. So if you're at the bottom, and I was taught this on day one when I was a police officer, is, is that if you go into an incident up there, angry, wanting to lock everyone up, you're only going to find that. So if you want to fight and you're angry, you're going to get a fight probably. It's very hard to come down than it is to go up. The other thing is to think you know, to control yourself, to think of the loss. So you think of your loved ones, the family, because I'll tell you something now, you can't protect them if you're in a cell. And that's the truth behind it. So if you get arrested, you can't protect your loved ones from uh, the any anything else. So if you're in prison cell for five years, who's going to take care of your kids? You know, if you get jailed, those are the things. What's on the line is to think what's on the line. You work. You go to work the next day, your job, your career, your house, your mortgage, all these things are on the line. They're, they're massive. And you, know, you think you've got to know these things before you even think about martial arts. You've got to understand, you know, in your brain, you've got to have this component. What, about, what do you stand to lose by engaging in this incident? And that should all be preloaded. You should, and that's the process I always tell people to go down to start thinking about self-defense in phases. You know, we talked about Jeff Thompson, I call them phases, you know, um, combat phases. So you've got to think about all this before you get involved in your physical side of things. If I'm going to go live, what are the risks? And the, the risks better justify, you know, what I'm about to do. It better be literally my life is on the line before I go physical or something has been said that is so bad that I need to take action um for, for other reasons you know the, the you know i'm not here to judge people's what they do there's lots of reasons why people end up in fights but so yeah you've got to go at the bottom you've got to think about what you sent tried to lose and then de-escalate if there's one line i don't want any trouble is the best line that anyone can use i don't want any trouble and then you also want to get them thinking about their situation and you know Think of your family, mate. Think of your kids. Think of your uh, think of your wife, mate. You're going to be locked up. And also telling the story, you know, for example, if I was, you know, we got an issue in the car park, I'd say, hey, listen, Tommy, you know, what's going to happen is we're going to end up hitting each other. We're going to get hurting each other. And then we're going to both get locked up and spend the night in the cells. It isn't really worth it. And the, the other problem is sometimes if you've offended somebody, you might not be aware of you've offended someone, you can actually apologize. An apology takes two seconds to say, you know, I'm really sorry you, you feel that way. You know, someone's knocked their drink over you or you've accidentally knocked your drink over you, whether you have or haven't. You just knocked your drink over. Really sorry, fella. Let me get your drink. It'll be, the best, it'll be the best five pound or depending where you live a bit more. It'll be the best money you've ever spent because you don't lose the rest of the night. Yeah. And it's that opportunity cost. The, there is a cost of you going physical whether you like it or not. And there is a cost. What is that cost to you to go physical? And you and the better quality life you have, by the way, the more you have to lose, the higher that cost is. And you have to understand that, that you have to mentally know what it's going to take for you to go physical. It's got to be, a, for me, it's got to be a threat to my safety or somebody's threatening to harm me at a later date. Those are the things that will drive me physical because, you know, I'm not going to be sitting in my house waiting for someone to turn up. That's not the way it works. You know, you, I, I, I'm, it, it's, it's, that's a threat you need to kill you at a later date. It's still threatening to kill you. You know, you've got to deal with that situation head on, but that's a slightly different scenario. But yeah, you've got to um, know what you've got. It's going to cost you. What is this escalation going to cost me? And you want to know that risk before you even get into the escalation. And when you know that risk, that's going to allow you to make sensible decisions. But if you really want to disescalate, you know, you've got to say, listen, I don't want any trouble. That's your statement. That is your statement. 
I don't want any trouble, but you've got to mean it because there's lots of preemptive cases where they say, I don't want any trouble. And then they write hook them afterwards. You know, that's the reality. You've got to be, it's honestly, and, and you don't want that. And the other thing is an interesting, it's very difficult to hate anybody else once you know their story. Yeah. So when someone's telling, if you knew their background and what they've been through in life, what's happened here, sometimes it's very difficult to hate somebody because we don't have the empathy. We just see like somebody giving it the big in front of us. So, uh, or for whatever reason. So now obviously, you know, that's not always the case, but you know, it's very difficult to hate someone. You don't know their story, but so you've got to understand your costs, what it can cost you, what's going to happen, who that person is. They might have nothing to lose. And the other thing is, you don't know if they're armed or not, unless you know, unless, unless you can see a weapon, you do not know if they've got a weapon on them that they can bring out and use you. You think it's a fist fight, then it's a weapon fight. And you don't know that. That's why weapon training, weapon self-defense is a whole another area, because if, if they've not got one visible, and it doesn't mean they can't go get one either, after you've knocked them flying, they want into an hour, they come out with a samurai sword. And that's these things do happen. So you've got to think to yourself is it's not just that fight, what you're fighting in front of you, there might be hidden dangers as well. So to go to end up in a fight, there's so many, so much risk, it's got to really be worth it to do it. And so from a from a victim's perspective, so people that have been assaulted, attacked, mugged, that kind of stuff, what what are their kind of commonly recurring regrets, things they wish they'd done, things they thought they should have done? What what went wrong for a lot of victims? I mean, what People that have come at the uh, at the wrong end, what could they have done? What do, what's typically on their minds? Um, okay, so firstly, I've I've met, met a lot of martial artists that have been assaulted, yeah, and uh, a lot that suddenly find, including boxers, by the way. I you know, I've you know boxers, you could be the best, but I remember a case dealing with, and one of them is deceased now. Where a professional boxer was two of them together, they got beat up by six lads. You know, just because you're tough doesn't mean you're going to be able to beat up six lads. That's just not the way it works. And and also, just because you're a ten stone boxer doesn't mean you're going to beat a fifteen stone bloke who's got the best right hand and he's been practicing it from years ago. And you know, that's his whole technique is based around landing this big haymaker when you don't see it coming. So there's lots of things there. But and you know, I know of um, we there's some cases where martial artists have been a female martial artist has been sexually assaulted, dragged down an alleyway, and their systems have completely failed them to deal with what is a serious, aggressive, violent individual. So, you know, what we think real violence is and what it is are two different things. Real violence isn't street, co it isn't ring combat. It isn't dojo combat. Real violence is ugly. And some people are incredibly good at it who have never stepped foot inside a, a ring or any or at any training. They've been trained because some of them have been beaten up since the first day they walked on the earth, you know, and, and that's the reality. Some people have had horrible lives and they've learned violence through through experience. They've seen what works. They've seen how other people have achieved success. They've learned that way, you know, and they don't care about your rules. So victims, the big one is I never expected to happen to me. That's almost all the things that happen. And almost always people have an overinflated view of their own ability when it comes to self-defense. I have trained since I was a tiny boy in boxing, judo, grappling, wrestling, all kinds of valley judo and everything else like that. And still violence petrifies me. It petrifies me because, um, uh, you know, and I don't like people uh, take, take the mick out of me. I'm, I'll stand up for myself, you know, but the both me, but, but violence petrifies me. But what scares me more is how easy people are willing to get into it. Now, that, that, that is that overinflated ability why people get killed on, with one punch knockouts on the street and arguing in car park, super, supermarket car park because they have this overinflated thing that they can, we all think we're the hero of our own story. And that's probably one of the things I think I never thought it happened to me. It all happened so fast as another one that victims recurringly thought. And also when people get dragged down alleyways and things like that, it goes on forever. So, I mean, obviously it doesn't go on forever, but if you're being beaten up by a group and no one can see you and no one can come to your rescue for whatever reason, it didn't even have to be in an alleyway. It could just be a, a secluded area of town. Those incidents do last forever. They're prolonged. And that is another part of the problem where is your martial artist, a lot of martial artists aren't fit, you know, and they aren't fit to fight. And the other part of the problem is, you know, 
because we, we are skilled in martial arts, you're, you're skilled in your end. So if a kickboxer ends up in a, in a fight and ends up in a scuffle, where most things end up in like a bit of a vertical grappling mess, just because of we know it's very difficult to maintain distance in a, in a street fight, and you end up in this vertical mess, you've never done any grappling whatsoever. Your lactic acid is going to, muscles are going to fill up, your grip's going to go, suddenly your punches aren't going to work, and you're exhausted after 30 seconds. You know, the reality is self-defense is one of the best fitness things. People say run away. I love that advice. People say run away. Have you ever tried running away? I'll show you CCTV. You can see CCTV footage after CCTV footage of people who've run away and failed running away. Running away is harder than people think. I don't run very well anymore. I've got injuries. I don't, I don't run very well. Most people haven't sprinted since they were at school. So, you know, that advice of running away, they could be faster than you. In any case, and then you're giving your back where they could smack in the back of the head with an iron bar for all you know, because you've got your back to them. So there's lots of conflated advice out there in relation. People are coming up with these things because they're cliches, you know, kick them in the balls. Yeah, okay, great. That's that that might work, highly likely not to work. And the, you know, there's lots of things that people say. The reality is that violence is horrible. It's horrific, it's horrible, it's not something you want to do. There's the, the, the romanticized version of fighting in a dojo is very different than when you've got your face on the concrete being scraped up and having someone's size six, size 10 boot smashing against your skull. Those things are very different. So I think victims themselves, we all as men need a bit of a reality check as, an, as, as a race. And it happens with women as well, where especially more now. Whereas as we've all got our egos that are out of control. And part of that, I think, is we don't do enough. Um, we don't do combat sports. So, you know, if you go to a combat sport, you know that Tommy better than anyone else. There's nothing more sobering than sparring. Mm. One, you crap yourself when you get in the ring and, and find, and then two, it's humbling because you get find a 15 year old who can box your head off and you didn't know that was possible. And, and that also was a danger of other martial arts because we've got a positive feedback loop. So what we do is we create these situations such as we'll dress in padded suits or whatever. And I'm not criticizing drills. What I'm saying is we can have this reinforcement where we're really good. They go, oh, look, I hit this attacker five times and I hit the pad five times and he's gone down. Or we, we throw 10 punches and bash him and that's it, it's all done. That isn't the reality of violence. So we end up in this feedback loop where we're constantly reinforcing our own ego. Look how great I am. And then so no wonder you're so willing to prove yourself in the street. So if you want to, the best ego measure is if you want to be good at self-defense, go and go and get in the ring, mm -hmm. go and get in the ring because it will reduce your ego more than anything else. Go and do a judo tournament, go and face somebody else's combative skills. And then that is going to help you to control your own ego. It's probably going to be the best pill. You don't need to fought, you know, to be a great self-defense person. Like that. You don't need real experience. If I could offer any advice to anybody, it's having that ability to control your ego is probably the best self-defense lesson and the most humbling experience possible is to go and do those things that, that will, will make you feel scared. And that, because you know that, you're going to be less willing to go and get involved in a, in a serious a serious incident. You're going to not want to use your force. And the other thing, you're going to understand what it's like to be hit and hit. It's not fun. And so from, you know, so you say the... Uh... From a victim's perspective, it happens faster than they think, more suddenly than they think, it's more comprehensive than they think, help coming to them takes longer than they had imagined, you know, all those things are in their mind, and I suppose, would it be fair to say that, you know, 95% of their problems could have been avoided with a bit more awareness or forethought or, you know, some, some degree of being switched on, you know, some, some people are always going to get it, no matter what they do, but for a lot of people, it, it you can mitigate well. Yeah, I mean, we're so blasé in the self-defense industry because obviously people who watch your stuff are self-defense orientated. We're so blasé about it. Oh, we'll just use awareness without actually looking at what the neurological issues around awareness are. We always have this, we go back to Cooper's color codes and, and you know, like switch on, we got to be in, in, in red or whatever it is. That it's just, the reality is that awareness doesn't work like that. That's not the way the brain works, you know. And the other part of the awareness is our own ability levels, which all right, being aware of outside, if you've got a very different self awareness then that completely doesn't matter if you can be as switched on as anything but if you think you can handle everything you're going to see those things as less threat mm. you're going to see those things as less scary you're going to make decisions that are risky you're going to be the guy that walks home on your own in the middle of the night through the town center because you think you're untouchable you're going to be the guy who takes or the girl who takes you know risks with their safety because you've done martial arts and as i said it doesn't matter if you're a skilled martial artist you take on four people it's going to be tough you're taking on four people with and someone got a weapon. You're taking on three people and you think it's a fist fight, but one's got a knife. 
those things are all part of the process. So, you know, it's all right being aware of the environment, but being more self-aware is probably the biggest part of self-defense as I see it today moving in into the future, because we are living in this internet culture where you can go online and learn how to do all kinds of fighting. You can do all kinds of skills. You can go and do courses. You can go do classes, learning how to fight. And you can put a punch bag up in your room and do that. We've got white collar boxing, we've got everything. But the, the thing is you can become pretty skilled. You watch the USC and pick up enough to know how to fight just by wrestling with your friends in the front room. But the reality is that if you think you're better than you are, you're going to take risk with your safety. And that feeds back in. So if you, the, the big things we're fighting really are the front end and the back end. What yeah. happens before the incident and what happens after the incident? The middle part of the incident, you know, really is, is you know, depends on what happens here, what happens there. Choosing the right skills for the circumstances. You know, when you might find that 99% of your martial arts training is a complete waste of time. Because, yeah. but, so you have to train and select your techniques that you're going to use and have to be aware of what you're going to use before any incident happens. And you have to have this mental system that's going to allow you to do the right thing at the right time. If you think you're going to go into a self-defense situation and fight like you did in the gym, it's, it's just not going to happen. And, and you know, and if there's stories around there, floats around that, it's just not the reality. You know, it's one thing you being dead good at kickboxing or tie boxing or karate or judo or anything like that. Big difference when someone smashes your head against a brick wall. You know, how often do we train for that? We don't. And, you know, and it can happen. It doesn't matter how skilled you are because it just happens because they grab you at that time. You know, that's the way it is. And all of a sudden, now you're fighting a wall. And the wall, you've just been hit by a wall. Now you've, now you've got reduced cognitive ability. Now your defenses have gone down. Now you're all dazed. Well, m many people train when they're dazed. You know, so these things are reality. And then then all in a second, you've got two other people that come running at you. It, it's, it's, it's not it's all very different but if you get the front bit right and you understand the back end of a fight right then you'll select the right techniques for your training and you can enjoy all kinds of martial arts but knowing what techniques you're going to go to in self-defense is very very different and when it comes to the criminal's mindset so so you know we like to use the word bad guy it's obviously a lot more shades of gray than that not many bad guys think they're the bad guy uh, but when it comes to the criminal mindset what is it that makes them effective that people could learn from and potentially use themselves what makes it what makes a, a good criminal good <laughs> that's a difficult question really criminals and it depends on the background of the individual obviously but you know it it, it depends because most people get involved in altercations these days it's not criminals it's 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 you know they fall out with a guy in the road rage incident or something like that but you got to think a criminal has got a job to do so if we take it as a criminal, you woke up in the middle of the night, somebody's in your house, we woke up in the middle of the night and somebody's breaking into your car or you're walking down the street and there's a group of youths who are, who are known to assault others. You won't know any of this, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the reality is they've all probably experienced violence more than you. And that's the truth. Some of these guys might have had 10, 20, 30, 40 real violent incidents in their life. They might have assaulted 40 people and they've picked up a collective band of experience Plus, they share stories. They've got tactics. I once um, remember seeing CCTV footage of an incident, which is quite classic. A group of Asbury youths, nothing much on their own, 18 years of age, skinny, um, man in his house, six foot five, in his 40s, strong, powerful man. They took him down like, um, you know, <laughs> like I would dare say a, a, a lion's taking down a, you know, a gazelle or whatever. They took him down like a pack. And it was pre pre rehearsed. They knew all about it. They knew what to do. Everyone had their roles. They got him in the middle. He went after one of them. And as soon as he grabbed onto one of them, the rest of them joined him. And then their job was they dragged him to the floor. They dragged him to the floor where they could kick his head in. And that is pre rehearsed, pre they, whatever. They don't sit there and develop tactics. They don't sit there and say we do that. It just happens because that's the way certain crime happens. You know, criminals who are going to hit you, just smack you. They just there's no warning for it. They don't want to. They're after hitting you when you least expect it. They want to expose you at your most vulnerable. They don't care about some kind of rules or bravado. They'll glass you in the face as soon as you turn around. You know, they they, they you could be in a bar and someone's taking an issue of you and you won't know about it and they just glass you. They and they because they're not bothered about the actual incident, how it, they achieve their result. They're just interested in the end result, which yeah. is that, that, that they beat you up. They stole your car. They were burgled your house. They raped your wife. Whatever it is that they're going to do, that's the end result that they they want to do. And they've considered the fact that they may get hurt or whatever in the monks of it. And they developed a range of tactics around that. 
they've not sat down like we would do and analyze it and write, write it down. Like it's just evolved over time. Something they've learned, it's a learned behavior. And, and so that's the reality is there's some guys out there that are really handy who have never been set foot in a boxing gym, but the dad showed them how to punch and they just got a natural right hand on them. And, you know, they walk up to you and they'll ask you a question, ask you for a light and then smack you in the face. And I think recently the, the terrorist incident happened in Birmingham. I was watching on the TV, the, the, the criminal asked them for a lie to ask them a question before he knifed them. You know, that's a pre, pre, we know that. We know that's a self-defense thing, asking a question before launching a strike. So, you know, criminals do have these practices. They're far more clever than we make out. They're, many of them are quite intelligent, just led very different lives. So what I would suggest to anybody is don't underestimate these bad, bad people out there. There are bad people out there, which makes it even more important that you take actions to protect yourself from these people and take steps, not necessarily action steps, to avoid coming into their contact. If you go drinking in a rough pub, expect trouble. And, you know, if you go walking home down the streets late at night, it's not the way it should be. It isn't the way it should be. But we have to take decisions based on a society. There's, there's not enough cameras on the streets. There's not enough street light and there's not enough police officers. We know these things. So we have to take logical steps and that's part of the process. So we don't end up in the criminal's world. And, you know, and that again, becoming self-aware it's not, a, you know, we, we have a talk about the women issue and things like that, where, where men have been accused. Men have got a part to play in all this. We do. But the reality is the same in terms of men play that part, but society has to play a part too. We have to invest in all these things, night buzzes, stuff like that. There's loads of things that go on there and, we, and that isn't happening right now. So we have to deal with the present circumstances. How, how typical is it in your experience for criminals to be armed? Are, are criminals or people with bad intentions are they armed more than the average public would expect? You know, a lot of people worry about knife crime and things like that. You know, how prolific is it for, for people to go out armed, even if they don't think they're in the process, you know, there's no planned crime, but just ambiently they'll go around tooled up. How common is it for, for people to be tooled? It's really, really common, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's like a, a, a samurai sword or anything like that. You know, I think with the youth culture today, the vast majority of youth are arming themselves. We see evidence of that all the time. If I was a young person, I'd be really, you know, I, I, I worry for my son, you know, and worry for my son as he gets older and, and stuff and that he's a great kid. And, and, you know, he could just be going down McDonald's with his friends and something. And he could have an issue and someone's got a knife, you know, because literally in my town, somebody did get, one of it did get stopped and stabbed at McDonald's in the subway. And that's only down the road. And it's in, in a relatively nice area. And it's just that these things do happen. Youth to today have got this obsession with knife crime. And I actually don't think our generation is doing enough to stamp that out, if I'm honest with you. And I don't think sports celebrities are doing enough the boxers, the UFC stars, the British people, they're not doing enough to stamp that culture out by calling it out for what it is, which is cowardly behavior to carry a knife. I think that there could be a lot more done in that issue because what you want to do is attack the status of carrying a knife. They're carrying a knife for increase their status within their group. Look at me, I'm really hard and dangerous. I'm carrying this knife. The reality is, and they're probably prepared to use it if need be. The reality is we need to reduce that status to say what, you know, so people say, oh, idiot, mate, why carry a knife with you? But obviously we have a lot of youth crime. We have a lot of drug dealing now involved in youth and it's exploded over recent years. That's linked into poverty and it's all part of this big ecosphere. But yeah, expect criminals to carry weapons, even if they aren't illegal ones, they'll carry screwdrivers, they'll carry um, knuckle dusters, they'll carry uh, anything they can make into a weapon because they feel vulnerable. It allows them to protect themselves. A weapon takes you, leaps you up without having skills, you know, and you might even have a brick in the pocket or anything like that. It could be loads of things. If you're a bad person doing bad things, it's likely you've got a tool to do those bad things with you. If you're breaking into a house, you'll have a screwdriver. If you're going around breaking into cars, you'll go be going equipped as they call it. You know, you'll have a, a screwdriver on you, which acts as a weapon, which you're prepared to use it. Some even have hammers, things like that. You know, bad people do walk around the streets. If you've got somebody with mental health issues, or maybe even not mental health issues, but, but a personality disorder who wants to cause harm with people, you walk around with a hammer, you don't care. Is, is after causing somebody harm. First person he sees or whatever the circumstances, I'm going to go after someone in this culture. I'm going to go after someone who's this type of individual. You know, we see it all the time. Men against women, women against different, men against different races, women against certain girls. There's, you know, there's, there's, we see it. You don't know where it's going to happen. Walking across the park at night, walking your dog, 
yeah. whatever these situations can come into your life at any time and, and it's you know so you've got to be aware but weapon defense is a whole other beast it's a whole different scenario than physical fighting and most people get weapons defense really wrong because we've got this again this romanticized version of knife defense of of drills uh, that link back to martial arts there's a big difference between middle linear martial arts and stopping a pointed blade from sticking in you you know, you don't need to, to be flashy to stop that from happening. You need to have good, you need to just focus on the task at hand. So it's, it is part, martial artists won't like hearing these words. So again, that goes back down to the self-awareness. If you think you can stop someone stabbing you and from hurting you, it is literally, it is, you are off your head. The chances of stopping someone from stabbing you who's deliberately trying to do it is really, really slim. You're going to get hurt and you are going to probably get serious injuries. So yeah, we've got to, you, most criminals are armed. It doesn't mean that you can arm yourself. That's not the that's not the way it works. Not the way law works. But you've got to be understanding that, and that goes all the way back to the beginning of how you deal with situations. Really, really matters, and how you take that risk. What's the risks to your actions? And I find that people are getting a lot more brazen. So since I've moved to London, I've had two two attempted assaults, street thefts on me. Now I'm. Six foot three, nearly six foot four. I'm 18 stone. I've got a shaved head. I've got a big beard. I walk around with boots and a coat. <laughs> and I've typically got my head on a swivel. I'm not an idiot. And so, you know, when people talk, oh, well, I'm, I'm big or my boyfriend's big or my partner's big or I've got a big dog, that'll put people off. Just doesn't. Just doesn't. People are so desperate. They don't, get, they don't care. They absolutely do not care how big you are, how mean you look, what yeah. you do. The circumstances, Tommy, were the, were the people trying to commit crime or was it just people with a problem with you? No, so I had, I had a, an attempted, so in the middle of the day in Lewisham, in London, I had two women that were being run by a man run at me and put their hands, try and put their hands into my pocket. Uh, from the front, very obvious, the most obvious, you know, I expect a, a pickpocket to have a bit of class, a bit of finesse. I'm expecting, you know, a bit of Dickensian uh, <laughs> sneakery, but lunged, lunged around my pocket. And uh, grab one of the girls' wrists, give it a bit of a nasty twist. And I'm, I'm a little bit horrible, but you know, it, it ends there. But then her mind of the man that's obviously running the show takes a few steps forwards. I give him a look that makes him take a few steps back and he goes. But I'm thinking, if you if I was those that group of three criminals, two women and one man, watching a cash machine in the middle of the day in Lewisham, why would they pick me to attack me from the front? Because I'm I was very overt with looking around, I always do. I was much bigger than all of them. Like they wouldn't have stood a chance. They would all have to be very tooled up to get anywhere near to, to doing anything bad to me. But they tried anyway. And, you know, let go of the girl. She fucked off. I, I reported it. But, you know, they're going to do that again tonight to some old woman or some old man or some young girl or some young lad or some student, some skinny student. Yeah. You know, that's going to, they're just going to rinse and repeat that. But I found it quite interesting that that happened. Then the other one was actually just a couple of days ago. Uh, man on a tube in London, uh, begging, walking up and down the tube. One man didn't look up at the man that was begging, and it made the, the, the guy just lose his shit, and he started pulling his glasses off and ripping the newspaper from his hand and pushing him. You know, he's a business-looking man. He wasn't putting up any resistance. He was cowering. Everyone else on that tube was a mixed tube. It wasn't like full of small girls. Mixed tube, mixed crowd of people, all just looking away on their phones or just moved to the other end of the tube. So I had to manhandle him out and then the transport police got him. Someone I was obviously called or texted because he'd been mithering people up and down this tube. Um, but it was just me. That even the man that I was helping did not help me remove the man. Which, you know, it's, it's it, you know, people think, oh, everyone will help me or everyone will join in. You know, they have imagined, they imagine it like, a, like uh, you know, the 9-11 films where you tackle the terrorist and everyone joins you and it's all like a collective heroic effort. It's not like that. So when you do try and do stuff, remember it sometimes it could just be you. It was just me. I mean, luckily I'm a big dude. He, he didn't he didn't stand a chance really. But it's not the point. The point is that everybody else was very passive, very afraid, or just ignored it completely. Ignored the stimuli. You know, they, they yeah, ignored, yeah. Um, And this is on. You know, this is in a posh bit of London. This is St Paul's. You know, this is. Uh, but you know that. So those things surprised me. And that's why you know I always laugh. I'm a big guy. I have a good awareness, but I still, I carry all the gear. I still, you know, personal safety alarms. Women laugh about these things. They're like, I've got, I've got alarms. I want to mitigate every risk I can possibly have. I want alarms. I want spray. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go all the benefits I can put in my favor. 
yeah. wow, because criminals don't care. Do they? they don't care how big you are. They don't care. And they don't care. Yeah. It's you, the, your job to them. Yeah. That's the reality. Is I mean, there's difference when things are... We, I always say crime happens either because it's a lack of emotional control or yeah. they're using... They're using sorry, violence happens because it's a loss of emotional control where things have got over the top. Or secondly, it's a tool to achieve a set result. Yeah. And if the set result is greater than the risk to their safety, you know, and it's worked before, because I dare say that dash one at your pockets has worked successfully quite a lot. They wouldn't yeah. do it otherwise. And they'll probably say they, they'll do it on you because generally speaking, you might, you might oh, cracky, you're so shocked. Yeah. It's like shock and awe tactic. You actually freeze, and they're reliant on that from happening. And maybe they even got a weapon as a backup if they need to in the back pocket yeah. or something like that. You know. So if you get resistance, it's it's a knife up there because they're so close to you. There's, they'll have a tactical game that's played out on that that's worked for them for whatever reason. And it might be the most simple thing like that, running at somebody, taking out the pockets, and it's the most. What are you doing? What are you doing? Stop it. You know. And, um, there's loads of. There's, or maybe she's going to start screaming. He's just attacked me. He's just attacked me or something like that. You know. You don't know. But you're right. We, we know that things, society is becoming more, more blase and more open about stuff. You know, crikey, especially on the internet. You've got people threatening everyone left, right and centre. And, and um, you know, some of the comments you get on videos are absolutely appalling uh, from people. And, and, and as a martial arts industry, we promote this big ethic uh, that we are, you know, anti-bullying and stuff. You'll find the biggest bullies in the world within the martial arts industry. You go online, you can see the abuse. That is, it's hard to maintain the rhetoric. Stuck, join, join martial arts clubs because to protect yourself. Well, you'll find the opposite. There's some nasty people in the martial arts industry. Go online. Anybody can check a YouTube video and you'll see it all. And that's that's the, that's the truth, um, the sad truth about the industry that we've got at the moment. But yeah everyone's got a bit of a chip on the shoulder these days. And I think that's probably, um, and more people are more desperate. And as interest rates rise globally, there's issues, more and more crime is going to happen. There's lots of political unrest. There's lots of racial tension. There's lots of society issues, which are going to be in a pressure cooker until, until it boils over. So yeah, crime happens in relation to what happens in society. But yeah, it is it's pretty tough out there at the moment. So to kind of wrap up, it's been really, really interesting. Could you, you know, for any advice from a policing perspective that people could take away? And could you tell people a little bit about your book? Because it's a really good book. It's really, really interesting. I think it gives a different perspective to people about staying safe. We often, one of the problems I find in the martial arts community or the combatives community is we get a lot of advice from doormen and soldiers and their lives and the crime that affects those people is very different to the crime that affects Brenda 43 admin assistant from Swindon you know that she things that she can learn from a 20 stone bouncer that's worked the doors in Birmingham is going to be very different to what she needs so personally just to put it out there I think your book was really good and really refreshing in it's a normal human's view from a educated police professional police perspective seeing violence all the time you know, what it's about what to think how it works all the pre and all the posts so that's really useful but yeah if you could talk any kind of last words of advice and a little bit about your book and where people can get it? Yeah, cool. Um, so if you get the book, I'll, I'll drop a link to you, Defeat Any Attacker, the book's called. Um, it's basically a very large book. It took me years to write. Um, and and that is probably, it, it, there is some, I have to say some typos in there because it's taken so long. It's so big, it's huge. And it, the idea behind Defeat Any Attacker was my, my sort of swan song to the martial arts world in terms of I needed to take this knowledge to put it out there because I felt that it wasn't out there and there was this missing gap. And so you can get it from my website, um, selfdefenseexpert.com slash defeat any attacker. It's on the website, loads of buttons on there on the website to get it. The, the, the thing with the style, the thing with defeat any attacker, it's volume one. It's not weapons. We don't cover weapons because we've got to cover the mental aspect and you've got to build your own plan. You've got to build your own system of self-defense based on your own skill sets, your own strengths, what you're good at. But you have to do it before you ever have an encounter. <clears throat> you have to understand what violence is like, what the reality of violence is like, what the police process is like, like we discussed, and that's in the book. We discussed, and then also open your eyes to perhaps another way of technically building your system in terms of looking at you know what techniques you're going to select to go live. What are your preemptive selection going to be? Because if it's reactive, it's slightly different. You're on the you're on the, the end of it. You know, are you? Do you have the skills to the self defence? Can you defend? What happens if you're against a group or anything like those things? You've got to have these considerations. It's all about building your own plan. 
It's all about knowing those phases of combat, like the Jeff Thompson would talk about, and I call them phases, for, you know, beginning, middle, and end. Knowing what techniques you're going to use in the beginning, knowing what techniques you're going to use in the middle when it goes live, what's your go-to techniques and what your go-to tactics are. You know, you're on the floor there standing. What are you going to do? You know, you go, you know, and also pressure test those techniques if you can. And also what's going to happen at the end? What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with an incident? What's your commitment? Very interesting psychological principle called the law of consistency, which, you know, we have to be consistent with our actions. And that's the whole thing. Write down what you would do in a self-defense situation and write down as many situations. What would you do if they're stood in front of you? What would you do if someone called you a rude name out in the street? You know, have these conversations with yourself, write them down, commit, and then be consistent. I'm going to be the guy that looks to de-escalate conflict all opportunity. Be that person. Or if you want to choose to be the hothead, that's, that's your decision. If you want to choose to show people that you're the alpha male, that's a decision. <clears throat> I don't think it's great for self-defense purposes, but that's a decision you make. And I think from a policing point of, point of view, for police officers, both currently in the job and those who, people who interact with police officers, you have to understand they are story builders. That's all they are. They are story builders. They are collecting evidence to tell a story because they have to be, because they're accountable. And how you are will interpret how you are will change that story how that story is told you are the character in this story you need to tell it started once upon a time they're building the story you can then have an influence on how that story is told and it can either be told positively in your favor or negatively in your favor and and that's that's the goal you've got to understand that they're there to do a job to record evidence handcuffs going on does not make you a guilty person have that conversation with yourself being arrested did not make you a guilty person. Stood in Crown Court or Magistrates Court, being found guilty makes you a guilty person. So it's having understanding that it's a process. Just like we spend a lot of time in combatants in the South Defence community understanding adrenaline, yeah. we then spend very little time understanding the legal situation. I just want to finish with this core point. I know we've gone over a little bit, but <clears throat> South Defence is two, two things you need to understand that. Is it self defence is the first thing? And is it reasonable force is the second thing? You can use be use self-defense doesn't mean you're using reasonable force. And that's the problem. A lot of people think that just doing any defensive action whatsoever in a situation is self-defense. It isn't. It has to be reasonable for the circumstances as well to make it lawful. And that's the thing. You have to have to be self-defending yourself, it has to be reasonable force. So is it self-defense? That will be decided. And then is it reasonable force? It's those two things that make up a defense of self-defense. So if you're going to, and there's a lot of people trying to be blasé about that in terms of, well, I, I can preemptively strike and this that, and the other, or I'll take him down and choke him out and things like that. Well, that's a lot harder to justify than people think. And I know people just think, it, oh, I just need to use reasonable force. That isn't it. Is, is your action justified as a self-defense? Is it defending yourself? Or you know, a reasonable any reasonable person would think that way. And is the force reasonable? Is it excessive? Because you can be defending yourself, knocked into the ground with reasonable force, and then you put the boot in when they're unconscious on the floor, or you stamp at them, or you hit them when they are completely out, or you even take them down and they can't, they're, they're completely unable to do anything, and then you choke them out. And whatever it can be deemed as excessive force, even though you were completely justified in doing it. There are some technicalities that can get you off these things, but those are the things that's important to understand that, that you probably don't understand the law well enough to be so blasé about going into combat and self-defense situations. And that's the truth. I have a good working knowledge of law. I'm not a prosecution barrister. And yes, there are defenses, but we have to understand our, 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 our place in it all. And we shouldn't be so willing to go into violence or any on any circumstances. You know, alcohol is a horrible thing. It gets people to, to say and do things that shouldn't we shouldn't do. But what my core message with this is there's a lot of self-defense instructors who think they know the law that don't. And that's that's and when you're teaching self-defense, if you don't know the law, you better be damn sure that you're teaching something um, that is legally compliant, because otherwise you're arming your students with knowledge that can hurt people. And, and that's, that's the truth because you're training them to take out a certain action. And that's different than martial arts. You can do anything with martial arts. If you're teaching martial arts, teaching martial arts, it's an art of martial art. When you're teaching self-defense, there's a lot of, you know, you as an instructor has a lot of responsibility to teach ethically what you're doing and teach tactics as well.
most people are not even teaching tactics. So, you know, that's probably the, the finishing point. But if you want to check out the book, you know, it's on selfdefenseexpert.com. Go over there. You'll find buttons. It's called Defeat Any Attacker. We've also got a free book on there, The Self-Defense Scriptures, which is a short, short ebook you can have a look at. It gives you more of my mindset. And the, the big book is more of the same, really. So it's a really good book. So I encourage everyone to go out there, get a new opinion. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air because it's a very different perspective to what's out there. So uh, thanks, Andrew. And we'll uh, we'll call it there.